evening, Calvary Old Path. Welcome once again to our Wednesday night online service. Uh, let's have a pr word of prayer. Hopefully you're all gathered there in your living rooms. Your Bible's in hand, ready to go. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name tonight. As a fellowship, God, we're gathering in our individual places. We want to honor you, God, in our praise. Giving you glory. Thanksgiving, God, thank you, Lord, for watching over us. Thank you, Lord, for just being in our midst. God, that we know that you're here. And Father, as we lift up our sacrifice of praise tonight, may you be pleased. May you be glorified in it. We direct our countenance upward, Lord, looking into the heavenlies. For that is where our home is. So be blessed, God, by the praises of your children and lifted up in our hearts. We bless you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. And 
wait for the Lord. My soul waits. I wait for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. I wait for the Lord. In His word I place my trust. In His word I rest. In His word I place my Yeah. 
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Right. 
sisters who are watching or be magnified in our midst. Let your word do that perfect work and have your perfect way and will in us. We need you, Lord. We love you. We bless you. We honor you. All praise and thanksgiving to your wonderful, awesome name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. So uh, get up and greet and meet each other. We'll be right back.
Well, good evening, everyone. It's our Wednesday night study. I am so not used to this, looking at a, a building with, with empty pews. I miss you guys dearly. Um, thank you for dropping in and dropping off your ties and bringing food. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Um, and hopefully you're taking advantage of this time, you know, being, being uh, inside together, more family dinners, more maybe game board nights, I don't know, but hopefully you're all taking advantage of that downtime in spending as much time as you can with each other. And I promise not to take you uh, take a long time tonight so I can get you guys home in time. See, if you were here, that would be a laugh, but it's, it's very quiet. Um, some things to go over tonight. On the webpage, Don has been updating content, and we've been adding video devotions. We're calling them Vedivos. And I think we have one scheduled for tomorrow, or maybe Friday, I can't remember. But on the Facebook community page, if you're subscribed and a member, you'll, you'll see a lot of things that we're posting. We're doing some, some new things with this online and technology that we hope can keep us all together, keep us all connected, you know, involved with each other. I loved the service selfies that you all forwarded to Don last Sunday. They were, they were awesome. Keep, keep doing that. Just keep on sending them to Don. Any uh, ideas you might have on the web page, we added a prayer request button. So we are praying. And tonight we're going to pray before the study for some prayers that just came in. Um, so take advantage of that. Our college group is doing a, a platform with Zoom, I believe, for their, their meeting. And high school, I think, is going to be going on an Instagram live with uh, Luis and AJ. So we're, we're trying some different things. We're all working outside the box and coming out of our, our comfort zone. So bear with us. You guys have been phenomenal, really. And bless you. I, I love receiving the emails and the, and the words of encouragement that lifts me up. You know, in this in this big lonely building, but um, tonight we've got some prayers I want to kind of share with you. There's one coming in from uh, our brother Billy. He used to serve at uh, church in Idaho. There's a pastor there by the name of Lou Phelps, and he was on life support a few a few nights ago. Some really bad infection going on, but getting some some good reports from his wife. He's she's been giving him some updates. So we want to continue to pray for him. He was on some really, a lot of, of uh, antibiotics. And I think Billy sent me an update tonight. I'll try to update the webpage. But if you want to put Lou, Lou Phelps on your, on your prayer list uh, from uh, Dawn, her, her prayer was for her granddaughter and her daughter Kathleen and uh, Zared. And that would, they would raise up that new brand, grandbaby in, in a godly way. Um, couple from our online community carol gibson carol how you doing out there she's asking for prayer for a gentleman by the name of micah he's 40 years old he's father of nine children currently hospitalized uh, excuse me hospitalized i think he had suspected covid uh, virus but i think that that was out of the out of the picture they ruled that out but i think he's had some heart issues or a heart attack that he's dealing with so we want to lift up micah on Carol's behalf, is requesting that request. And also for Carol's brother, he's 80 years old. His name is Jim Gibson. Carol's been sharing with him. He is not a believer, and he's resistant to the gospel. So hopefully in these times, he'll open up his heart uh, to, to receive you know, further, further encouragement and uh, readiness to, to hear the truth. And whatever other prayers that may be represented, we have also, well, I'm remembering, we have a young, young girl in our fellowship by the name of Willow. She had a, an, an abscess on her appendix or something like that. And they're waiting for that infection to clear. They had to postpone the surgery. So we want to lift Willow up in our prayers tonight. And whatever prayers you might have, if, if this is being streamed on the YouTube, you might want to write some prayers down in the chat side so you all can be praying for one another in those, those kind of areas of your life. So let's uh, just take that time right now and we'll lift up these prayers together. Father God, we, we give you thanks and, and give you praise, Lord, that you hear us, Lord, just like you heard Hezekiah as we reviewed that on Sunday morning. We ask, God, for these prayers that have been mentioned, those that are unspoken, Lord, that are represented in our, in our homes and our households. We ask, God, that you would touch them, 
those who are in need of medical attention and um, waiting for further direction from their doctors and their medical teams. God, will you give them comfort in this time? Give them assurance, Lord, that you are there, that they are not forgotten. Father, for those in our body that are afflicted with, with job loss, loss of income, Lord, support them and give them, give them uh, encouragement in these times as they wait things through, as they wait on, on programs and unemployment, whatever they find themselves in. Lord, sustain them and give them peace of mind. Lord, for those who are having to make very tough decisions concerning anything, Lord, in their life, I, I pray for them. God, that you would lead them and that you, you would guide them. For our fellowship, Lord, for our body of believers here, online and in presence, God, will you surround them, Lord, with your love, surround them with comfort, with your healings, Lord, protect them, Lord, uh, with your holy angels. Your word says that an angel of the Lord encampeth those around, around about those who fear you, Lord. And so set your holy angels, Lord, in place and protect us, God, from those things that are around us. And tonight again, Lord, as we lift up this time in your word, bless us, Lord, in it. Give us understanding, Lord, in the wonderment of your word as it points to the person of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer, as we see these scriptures come alive to us in Hebrews. And Lord, with, with pen and markers in hand, God, we just ask again for the leading of your Holy Spirit to direct us uh, in this time together. And again, we, we just rely upon you to sustain us for, for everything and throughout, Lord, the duration of, of our, our country's um, malady, what we're going through. Lord, we, we just pray uh, your hand go before us. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you turn in your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in Hebrews we're actually going to start chapter 3. I stopped short last week in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 for a reason, because the next two verses really kind of introduce a different concept. So I wanted to break there. And if you were with us, it just seems funny, last week there was a, there was a full house of people uh, in, this, in this sanctuary. But we looked at Jesus. We looked at that chapter as kind of a descriptive chapter of who Jesus is. And remember the writer is putting forth an argument to believing Jews and non-believing Jews, brethren, Hebrews, of this person, Jesus Christ, wanting them to, to look at him and to all that he represents. And in chapter 2, we saw that he was crowned with glory, crowned with honor, and that he tasted death for everyone, that he was the author of salvation. He was perfected in, in suffering. He was a family member. He calls us brethren. We'll see that tonight as well. Uh, he destroyed and destroys the power of the devil. He frees us all from the fear of death. He is the merciful and high priest, which we'll see uh, again mentioned tonight. And he was tempted in all regards just like us. So we saw this pointing to Jesus that he's better. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's the creator of all things. In him all things consist, like it says in Colossians. So we're going to see this, this uh, preponderance of evan, evidence continue to build as we go into chapter 3. But we'll pick up tonight, starting in where we left off last week in chapter 2, towards the end, starting in verse 17. Therefore... He had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. We're going to park on that verse for a little bit and develop a theme that's going to be prevalent when we head into the later parts of chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 7, because he introduces the thought of the merciful and faithful high priest. For any Jew that would be here, that, that would immediately bring a, a vision or bring a, an understanding of that position. The high priest was, was the center piece of, of their communal life, the temple where everything took place. The high priest took a, a big 
role and responsibility. And so as a Jewish believer and an unbeliever reading this, they would be focusing in on that role of high priest. And the high priest in, in the time of, of the Jews was, was someone who would be a mediator uh, between God and man. They understood that would be a, a, a uh, obligation that the high priest would perform. He would mediate between the people and mediate uh, towards God. He would also serve to intercede and make sacrificial atonement for the people. He would be the one that would go in and, and sprinkle um, the blood on the mercy seat. There are other duties that would have been only that, that the high priest could form. One of the things would be to wear the Urim and the Thummim. The people would go to the high priest as he, as he would have that Urim and Thummim and he would be able to pull out the, the and we don't really know what it was, but somehow it was a, it was a, it was dedicated to find truth to find truth and, and to also separate falsity with the Urim and Thummim. And you can find that in Numbers chapter 27, verse 21. So they would look to the high priest for truth. We know in the New Testament, Jesus speaking of himself, you know, he's, he, he didn't speak of truth, which he did. He spoke of himself as being the truth. John 14, 6, I am the way the truth and the life. So you're going to see that built in as we go on to the chapter. Another thing, when the high priest died in the Old Testament, that's Numbers chapter 35, uh, if you want to reference it. When the high priest would die in any city of refuge that a person would find himself, if they accidentally killed somebody, they would, they would go to, the, to a city of refuge. And if it happened to be that the high priest would have died, then those people would be granted complete and unconditional freedom. They would be able to leave. And that particular charge that was against them would have been dropped. So you can start to see how these images of the high priest slowly are going to be transferred and attributed to, to Jesus. Another thing about the high priest is he had to be whole, had to be physically um, with no defect and holy in conduct. That's Leviticus chapter 21. So it's important to understand the role of the high priest. In Aaron's day, in Moses' day, the priesthood was established uh, through Aaron. You know, God was building up, and that's in um, Leviticus chapter 8, Leviticus chapter 9, and chapter 10. If you want to write that as cross-reference, you can go back and review that yourself. But God instituted the role of the priesthood through the line and the tribe of Levi. And it was a very important duty. And one of the most important duties, again, for, for the high priest would be to sprinkle that, that blood on the, on the mercy seat. And so coming up in September, I think, the Jews today will be celebrating Yom Kippur, but they would bring the blood back in the day into the Holy of Holies, and it was, it was a somber day, and they would make atonement for the nation. But when you look in the Old Testament, because God is instituting the Aaronic priesthood, he's doing it through the tribe of Levi. The first priest that we're actually introduced to is a gentleman by the name of Melchizedek, earlier in the, in the book of Genesis. He is labeled as a priest. He's also labeled as a king, Genesis chapter 14, uh, verses 18 through 20. Write that down. I'm going to read it for you real quick. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, now he was a priest of God, most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered, or who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Long before Aaron, long before Moses, Moses Melchizedek was in the land, described as a king and as a priest. It's going to be important because as we see here, we're going to uh, see a, a psalm. Uh, that is going to be referenced to. Let's read the verse again. Therefore he had, back in Hebrews 17, he, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. He had to become us. He had to become human for a reason. What reason? That he might become a merciful and, and faithful high priest. I'll elaborate that in a second. And things pertaining uh, to God to make propitiation or make a recon reconciliation for the sins of the people. Going back again to Melchizedek, 
Melchizedek was not of the tribe of Levi. You know, this is before the tribes were even there. Melchizedek appears in Genesis, and then he next appears in Psalm. So I want you to, to turn to Psalm 110. I'm going to link all this together. Psalm chapter 110. It's not a long psalm, so I'll read the whole thing. Verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies and a footstool for thy feet. The Lord will stretch forth thy strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people will volunteer freely in the day of thy power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Thy youth are to thee as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Notice the next part. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at thy right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge amongst the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. It's a messianic psalm. You'll see in the first few verses, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's the place of king, place of royalty. In verse 4, you see the position of priest. And in verse 6, you see him as uh, the coming Messiah, the coming judge. Go back again to Hebrews chapter 3. So this is all pointing again to Jesus. The writer is using using alliterations he's going to be using scripture from he already has we saw that in chapter 2 pointing to the person of Jesus Christ so he had to take on human likeness uh, to do that turn to your right in chapter 4 look at verse 15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Turn to chapter 7. Again, when we get to these chapters, we'll break it down a little more. But chapter 7, starting in verse 26. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Go back again to Hebrews chapter 3. So we're seeing that he's been given a special designation later on in those chapters. What tribe did Jesus come from? Judah. Yes, good job, Jiva. So based on Mosaic law, you can see that Jesus himself would not qualify to be a high priest because he didn't descend from Aaron. He didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. So how is he better if he's not even part of the Aaronic priesthood? Well, we're going to see later that God made him after the order of Melchizedek. God can do anything he wants. Remember, the priestly line are human. We just read that. We are weak. The high priest, human high priest will make, will falter. Remember Zacharias in, in the Gospel of Luke when the angel Gabriel appears to him to announce that he's going to have a son. He didn't believe, and the angel struck him dumb and unable to speak. He was weak, weak in faith, couldn't believe. Aaron had two sons, if you recall, uh, Nadab and Abihu. Uh, and those two were raised in the priesthood to, to take over the role of high priest. They make their, their offerings to God, and, and you read that they offered up strange fire to the Lord. Not what the Lord prescribed, what happened to them. Fire came out of heaven. Very good, Jeeva. Jeeva's here. So, Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So the next day in the Jerusalem Post, there were two job openings for, for priests. Um, that's a joke, too. So I think you're laughing. But 
those two were, were consumed. Men are fallible. We make mistakes. They, they committed sin by offering this strange fire uh, to the Lord. So where do we find this perfect priest? It only comes from, from God. He has to appoint that perfect priest to become like us in all things that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. The faithful high priest had to keep guard over the tabernacle, had to keep guard over the tent of meeting. In Numbers chapter 18, uh, Behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to the Lord to do the service of the tent of meeting. Jesus was the only one who could fulfill the faithfulness of that role because of the fallibility uh, that we have, uh, that man is. Back again to verse 17, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation or to make propitiation. Jesus, the perfect man, because he is God, the only one who could be qualified to fulfill that role. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, if you want to write that down, Paul says that there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is now our high priest. Verse 18 of Hebrews. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He's going to show in, in, in his argument coming up that only Christ himself could identify with us like no other. He became man. He had to become come like us so he can identify with us. And yet we already read in Hebrews 7 that he was without sin, but tempted in every place, in every respect. He was tempted in that which he has suffered. He is able to come to the aid of those, that, um, of those who are tempted. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. You can write that down also as a cross-reference cross tonight. He identifies and is able to help us. No temptation, Paul writes, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. Remember, he's that faithful high priest. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So as he identifies in this role with us, as high priest, it's not, it's not something that is uh, not been visited upon him. He was tempted in every way, just like us, just like you and me. Jesus was tempted, and yet he sinned not. We could never fulfill that type of obligation. You could be perfect your entire life, and, and towards the end, just have one bad thought. And you've, you've broken every law. You've broken every commandment with just that one. When you think about Jesus, shortly after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness. And Satan meets him there. In the most weakest part of his life, after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, the enemy comes to him and tempts him. He tempts him with the lust of the flesh. You know, with, with the appetite, if if you be the son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. He tempts Jesus with, with the lust of the eyes. Bow, bow down to me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. They'll be yours. And he tempts him with a boastful pride of life. If you be the son of God, jump off to that building. Prove it. And every time the Lord would respond to the temptations of the enemy. And he would refer and say, it is written. The Logos would refer to the Logos. He would refer to himself. He would refer to the word. And that's, that's what we need to keep in mind, right? To fight temptation. To revert to the scriptures. To revert to God's holy word. And to keep us in that place of, of being saved. To keep us in, well in front of, of those boundaries. Not to skirt towards the outside, but Lord, to, we know that he will keep us you know, that, in, in that place of protection. If we adhere to his word. So he was tempted just like us. And he would confront the enemy and say, it is written. So he had to become like us. The word made flesh. 
All that is a background for chapter 3. Therefore, therefore why? Because everything we just read in the first couple of verses or the first couple of chapters. Therefore, because Jesus identifies with our needs, because he's been tempted in every way, because he's, he's a faithful and merciful high priest, because he's better than the prophets, he's better than the angels, he is the creator, he's the one who can, who can end uh, heaven and earth himself, itself. Because of all those things, therefore, the writer is saying, therefore, holy brethren. Notice now there's an elevation. Not only are we just called brethren, now our status is holy brethren. To be separated, to be sanctified. We're elevated now in our spirit, holy brethren. Partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. After he mentions that faithful and, and uh, merciful high priest in verse 17, he now says, I want you to consider him. He's going to be building up a case. He's going to be get, building up the argument of the things that I've just represented to you and just wrote in the, in the chapters before. Will you consider Jesus? Will you consider him? The apostle. And all apostle is, is really a messenger. And high priest of our confession. Think about these things. Reader, consider what he has done. Because he's going to be making that case. Verse 2, he was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. That word or the, the um, what he's about to re, re, refer to stems right off the, the thought of high priest. In the scripture... The Redeemer had to be related to, to the brethren. I wanted to backtrack. I missed the spot. The kinsman Redeemer. That's why he was called kinsman. He had to be related to the one who is going to be redeemed. So the kinsman Redeemer would go, and, and we have the book of Ruth that, that, that shows a beautiful illustration of the kinsman Redeemer. We are holy brethren to Jesus, our high priest. He now redeems us. He is our kinsman Redeemer. When you go and trans, or now we get transit to uh, chapter 2, that faithfulness that Jesus has as a high priest is now also going to bring in another pic person to the picture, the person of Moses. Moses also revered in Jewish mindset and culture, just like Abraham. Right? Remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and, and he, was, he was telling them, Abraham rejoiced to see this day. And the Pharisees were looking at him. You're not even 50 years old yet. And you're saying you, you've seen Abraham? You know him? And he says, before Abraham was, I, I, I am. You know, and, and they were taken aback. So the writer is going to be making a cause now, bringing another historical Old Testament figure to the argument. He's going to introduce Moses. Again, keep in mind, God, Jesus is faithful. Verse 2, he was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. That's Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. Jesus, uh, the Lord, Lord God, would speak, Yahweh would speak about Moses, and he would said, say, my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my household. The Jews would have known that. If, he, if they're reading the, the Torah, they would have come across that scripture in Numbers, and they would have known that Moses is a faithful servant in the household of God. They, they would have known that. And I want to show you the transition. He was faithful to him who has appointed him as Moses who was in all his house. Verse 3, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. By just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Who is the he who is referring to? Verse 1, he's talking about Jesus. The writer is saying, I want you to consider Jesus. Now I'm going to do a comparison. You remember Moses? Remember how it said in, in Numbers that he was the faithful servant in all of God's household? Well, now consider Jesus. The faithful and, and merciful high priest, what does he say? Counted worthy of more glory than Moses. That would have taken any Jewish hearer back because they highly revered Moses. You're saying this Jesus is more honorable, worthy of more glory? than Moses, than the patriarchs? 
So a Jewish believer and a Jewish unbeliever would have would have read this and it would have either put the hair on their on their neck stand out or they would have really taken notice of what's being said. So you can see the the argument start to increase and start to develop a little little bit more aggressively. Faithful to him, pointed as Moses also was on all his house. And I was going to get even more so. For he's been counted worthy of more glory uh, than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now he's going to make another jump. We saw in chapter 2 how the creator, only the creator, could roll up heaven and earth like a scroll. He's using the same type of, of verbiage here, the same um, um, type of style to, to point to Jesus in a greater and grander way. In math, there is a, a principle called transitive law. If A equals B and B equals C, does C equal A? Or A does A equal C? Answer is yes, transitive law. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. The builder of the house, someone has to build it, he says in, in verse 3. Uh, verse 4 but the builder of all things is God we've already saw in the last chapter that he's pointing to Jesus equating Jesus with God Jesus is the builder of the house Moses was just a servant though faithful in the household of God he was just a servant of the house Jesus built the house he is the one who is greater in that capacity because he's creator so the writer is making that presentation. He's, he's giving that, that argument, which is why you should consider Jesus. Verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son. In that same house that God built, Moses is depicted as a servant. Someone who doesn't have a relation to the one who built the house. Remember we saw in chapter 2, I just want to read it again, where he says in verse 8 or verse uh, chapter 1, but of the Son, he says, thy throne, O God. The Father God is calling the Son God. Christ was faithful as a son. You'll see that word faithful pop up quite a few times. Again, to distinguish the faithfulness of our high priest, Jesus Christ, against the unfaithfulness of man who fails all the time. Moses is faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony. But Christ was faithful in his son over his house, whose house we are. Now we're, we're looking not at a building, per se. Now we're looking at the writer saying, who is the house? We are the house. You are the house. We are the ones that God is building up. It's not a building, even though we meet and congregate in a place that has four walls. We are his house. We're the ones that Jesus is faithful to as a son. His ever, ever faithfulness as a servant to this house that God is building. I'll give you a couple of cross references. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writing to them says, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. So not only is he a son in the house, not only does he attend to the house who we are, but he's also the cornerstone of us in this building that God is putting together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul again writes to them and says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So that illusion or alliteration that the writer is putting and he's increasing that understanding of who Jesus is. That not only is he the son which makes him and qualifies him to be higher than Moses, but even the building itself is not a building built with hands. It's us. It's you and me. We are those living stones that are being placed in the building that God is, is creating. And that's mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 he says you also like living stones 
are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we see that slow buildup now really kind of, you know, in, in music, you, it's coming towards a crescendo. And so this timbre is building up, this fortissimo of showing who Jesus is to the reader. Verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and we're going to see here from uh, all of verse 7 to verse 11, that he's quoting Psalm 95, and we'll go that to there in a second, but let's read it first. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now go to actually the Psalm, Psalm 95, go to your left. In certain translations, there's no authorship ascribed to this psalm. I think the Geneva Bible ascribes it to David, and, and that might have been just the, the, the transcriber's um, writing. But in other translations, there is no authorship attributed to, this, to the psalm. But I wanted to, we'll go there in a second. Verse 1, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it. And his hands formed the dry land. This is where it's quoted, where we just saw in Hebrews. Verse 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Uh, oh, sorry, not there. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, this next verse, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter my rest. Now go back again to Hebrews. So the writer is quoting Psalm 95, but he attributes authorship to, verse 7, just as the Holy Spirit says. So the Holy Spirit is using or speaking in Psalm 95, specifically now in these verses, talking to the people who would hear this in the time that the writer would be writing this to the Hebrews. He's using an Old Testament illustration. Your ancestors who were in the wilderness, they didn't listen to me. I contended with that generation for 40 years. I watched over them and yet they would not walk in my ways. They wouldn't obey me. They wouldn't listen to me. And the writer is appealing to those who are, he's writing to now do not make the mistake of that generation. Do not make the mistake of our ancestors, who the Holy Spirit is now quoting from Psalm 95, and be just like them. Do not do it. Don't listen, or do not be in a place of not listening. Do completely the opposite. You need to be listening to what God is saying, to what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you in this psalm, through this, through this book, through this letter that I'm writing. Listen. You need to walk in the ways that they didn't walk in. Learn the lesson so that you won't be guilty of what they were guilty of and not being able to enter his rest. And that's going to be elaborated later next week when we look at chapter 4 together. So he's imploring the reader, remember our ancestors? 
Remember how back in the day they were, they were in, in, the, in the desert for all those years? And in all that time, the Lord contended, their constant murmuring, that they were stiff-necked people, and they would not listen, and they wouldn't walk in the ways of God. They, they, would, they were always going astray. Where? In their hearts. They would not learn my ways. And I swore in my wrath that they would not listen, or they would not enter into his rest. So that hardening of the heart can affect us even today. You know, the Lord might be speaking to you about something. You know, just because that was an example to the Jews, it also serves as an example to us. You know, that we shouldn't go astray. That we shouldn't harden our hearts. You know, that we should allow the word of God to come in. You know, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hardness of heart is, can, can lead to, to other things, and we'll see that here in a bit. Hardness of heart, not being able to receive from God. Hardness of heart, not, not able to, to feel, not able to, you know, to come to that, to that understanding because it's closed off. Nothing can penetrate the hardness of our heart. So we need to bring that to God every day. Lord, soften. We pray that, don't we? Soften my heart. Lord, I'm not receiving like I used to receive. When I hear the word, it goes in one ear or, or out the other. When, when, when I pray, if I pray, Lord, it, I'm half-hearted in those things. Is my heart starting to harden? It's good to ask ourselves that, that question. You know, there have been times in my walk where my heart's been hardened. Maybe it's because of a person. Or maybe it's because of a, of a circumstance. And I've closed myself off to the things of God. I've closed myself off to receiving from the Lord. So make sure tonight... You know, that if there's that creeping in that begins to happen and that hardening of your heart might be there to the things of God, ask him to soften it. Ask him to, to just to take out those things that, that are in there, any root of bitterness that might cause some, some hardness, any jealousy, any, any, any ought that, that's in there that you might have with a brother. Release it. Take, Lord, Take this out of my heart. Give me back a, a heart that, that's rejoicing, a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone that doesn't receive from you. He talks about that also in verse 12. Take care, brethren, lest there, be, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. You know... The Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his heart, don't harden. The hardening of, of that heart can lead to an evil and believing heart, unbelieving heart. And maybe that's you today. Maybe that fits where you're at. I don't know. Maybe you're tuning in. Maybe you're a prodigal. Maybe you've been away from the things of the Lord and what's going around us has caused you to come back and say, Lord, I, I, my heart's been hardened. My heart's been acting in an evil way. My heart's been acting in an unbelieving way. And I'm, I'm falling, I've fallen, or fallen, and, and am falling away from you, the living God. The writer says, take care, lest there be one in any one of you. Remember, these, these Jews who are listening, you know, some of them, they're not believers. Some of them are believers, but wanting to go back again. They want to fall back to the ways of of Judaism. You know, we saw that mentioned in chapter 2. He said, for this reason, again pointing to Jesus, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. So we've got to listen lest we drift. And now we've got to take care lest we have an evil heart, an un, 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 uh, unfaithful, unbelieving heart, and fall away from the living God. You see that escalation starting to happen. So that warning is prevalent in this chapter. So what are we to do? How can we in, be in that place? Or what is our response to staving off you know, a, a hardened heart, a, a heart that wants to um, be evil and be unbelieving? Well, here's a way. He gives an answer, verse 13. But encourage one another day after day. 
As long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encourage one another, he says. To be in that, in that place, to, to come alongside. That word in, encourage uh, in the Greek is the word parakleo. To come alongside, to guide, to comfort, to render aid, to assist. Parakleo. And it's related to what Jesus would say when he promised us that he would send us the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Parakletos. They both have the same root word. And so he says, be a parakleo to one another. Be someone who comes alongside to encourage. Be somebody who comes alongside to render aid and to render assistance to each other. And that's a, that's a way to keep somebody's heart from, from being disbelieving or unbelieving and, and evil and, and drifting or falling away. To be an encourager. We need to be as the best encouragers as we can in these days. We need to come alongside to be a paracleo. To all our brothers and sisters, even to the unsaved, especially to them. Because they aren't saved and they will spend eternity separated from God. So to be a paracleo, to come to the aid of, to come and, and assist. To rescue, to bring comfort, to bring hope. You remember the story, well I remember in the, in the New Testament. It's the same word that's used. There is a synagogue official by the name of Jarius, and he has a daughter who is, who is very ill. And he comes and seeks out the master. He comes and seeks out the teacher. And, and he says, Rabbi, my, my daughter, she's, she's very sick. And the word says, I believe, earnestly begging, earnestly uh, or diligently asking. He's, he's asking Jesus to be a paracleo. Will you be a paracleo to my daughter? She's in desperate need. She's, she's to the point of death. Rabbi, be a paracleo. Come to the aid of and come alongside. He goes, if you are willing. And Jesus said, I am willing. And so he goes with him to the house. But on the way there, if you recall, there's that woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. And she's the one who's, who's reaching out in the crowds and everybody's touching Jesus. He goes, if I can only touch the hem of his garment. And she makes his way over and touches Jesus' garment. And she becomes healed because of her faith. But because of that delay, Jarius' daughter dies. And so they're walking. They're walking towards the home. And Jarius' servants come. There's no need to bring the master. No need to bring the teacher. Your daughter has died. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. What does he do? He becomes a paracleo. He comes alongside. And he raises Jarius' daughter from death. We have brothers and sisters around us who might be in that place. They're, they're just dying because of their unbelieving hearts, because of their faithfulness of, of, of their hearts. And, and they've been walking in ways that are evil. Be a paracleo in these days. Come alongside and, and raise somebody up. Be alongside and elevate them in their faith. Pray with them. Text them. Message them. Call them. We're trying to do that on the, on the webpage. Dawn is, is putting up, I think today she put a, she put a little meme where there's a, there's a back and forth chat of texting going on if, you, if you're on there if, if you haven't seen it it's pretty cute it's really cool there's this conversation going on and you see a guy and a girl encouraging each other through this chat being a paracleo to one another so I want to encourage us as a fellowship I want to encourage Calvary Old Path to, to think about that to come alongside encourage one another day after day don't make it just a one time thing reach out there have been people in our body who have been coming I've been posting pictures Stella brought me some tacos. Way to go. Major paracleo today uh, with a taco lunch. Encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. Lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. While it is still called today. I like the urgency that, that he puts that in. While it is still called today. You know, the, the word says that when you hear it, because he said in, in chapter 
7 or verse 6 uh, or verse 7 today if you hear his voice he's appealing don't don't put it off there's a matter of urgency today today is the day of salvation so it says in isaiah go back again verse 14 we're almost done for we have become partakers of christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end and i love that picture too what are we partakers of we're partakers of christ of jesus himself everything that he represents we are partakers of 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 his suffering we're partakers of 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 the baptism into death uh, partakers of his resurrection partakers of his authority his exousia that he gives to the disciples we're partakers he calls us co-laborers we're fellow workers we'll be partakers of his glory when we are with him we're partakers of, of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end while it is said today if you hear his voice again that urgency do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me he re-emphasizes Psalm 95 it draws him attention not to just those verses that we just read now he narrows it reader are you listening Reader, are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Because here's where the rubber meets the road. If you hear his voice today, act upon it. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And he asked a couple of questions rhetorically. For who provoked him when they had heard? Question mark. And he answers, indeed. Did not all those who came out of Egypt and by Moses? Again, referring to the uh, ancestors that they would have all known another question to whom did he answer that they should not enter his rest but to those who were disobedient and so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief and so the appeal to the reader of Hebrews in this section don't be like they were don't walk like they walk Take heed today, believe, and consider this Jesus, this great, faithful, and merciful high priest, the one who is of our confession. Consider him. And today I want you to think about that as well. If you're tuning in, you know, maybe you've gone to church a little bit, you have friends that are, are Christians, but you haven't committed your heart, your, your life completely to Jesus. Maybe that hardness has entered into you. The unbelieving part has entered in and you know, you're no longer you know, impervious, I guess, to, to those things. I want you to consider Jesus tonight. I want you to consider who he is. The writer is pointing to him. He is God. And the lesson is, you want to enter into his rest? You better listen. You better act. And today is the day of salvation right now don't put off the decision and i've said before you know there's been some encouraging news today but we don't know how long it's going to go on there's going to be uncertainty here for weeks perhaps months in that time draw close draw near be assured tonight if you confess the lord jesus believe in your heart that 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 he is god and that god raised him from the dead the bible says you will be saved you and your household know tonight that you can enter into his rest. I want to lead you in prayer as we close out. And again, for all the things that we have talked about tonight and shared and the earlier praise, pra- uh, place, prayers that we, we lifted up, hold those close to your heart. Don't let just this just be a, a Bible study. Let it come alive. Let it be alive in your heart, in your walks. Tonight, tomorrow, be that paracleo. Come alongside as the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. Amen? Let's pray. Again, Lord, we we come before you as children, Lord, as your humble servants. Lord, and we thank you again for the word that you give us. We thank you, Lord, that you, you give us instruction and you give us direction, clear direction. 
And we can learn, God, from the lessons that, that you taught your people, Lord, back in the day, that we can apply those things to our lives. Father, you're never changing. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Lord, and we know that you are molding us, God, into that image and likeness of your son. You are the potter and we are the clay. Continue, Lord, to use us in these days. Help us to be that paracleo, God, to others. Lord, let us minister, God, your goodness and, and greatness, God, like we sung earlier. To point the way to you as a writer pointed the way to Jesus. Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to be uh, that same quality, God, now that your son has called us brethren. Holy brethren. Lord, and you're building a church with your people. So continue, Lord, to give us joy in, in, our, in the midst of what we experience every day, Lord. Let our lips praise you. Let our hearts be yielded to you, Lord. Let our minds uh, be steadfast upon you. Lead us and guide us, Lord. I lift up Calvary Old Path. I miss them so much, God. Lord, be with them, be with the families, uh, fathers and, and wives and mothers and daughters and sons, Lord, the family unit as they're sharing meals. Lord, once again, maybe for the, for the first time in a long time, help them to be paracleos to one another. We love you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you on Sunday.